Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Aristogenesis. In this episode, we'll be looking into not only the origin myths of the peoples and tribes of our ancestors, but also what hidden meanings these stories contain, the significance of these stories and myths to the people who told them, and, most importantly, what we can learn from them going forward into an ever-changing world. It may be rather obvious that this episode is considerably shorter than any of our previous uploads, but this is something new that we're trying, in order to play a ball a little bit better with YouTube's algorithm. We'll be uploading the different segments of our podcast separately, but you can find the full episode on our Spreaker, and Nordisk Radio and Odyssey channels. As always, in these increasingly turbulent times, we have to state that the love of one's own people should not be equated with the promotion of hatred for others. It should be said that in telling these stories, that should not be taken as our endorsement of their historic truth, but equally, we believe that all of the myths our ancestors told contain elements of truth. No smoke without a fire, as they say. Even if they don't, it is ultimately inconsequential to us and our intentions for this episode. These myths, however historically accurate they may or may not be, spoke spiritual truths to the people who told them, and are a living record of how these people think of themselves. Our current origin myth, for example, is that we all came from Africa and have spent the last hundred thousand years trading with one another until the evil white people showed up and stole everyone's land. This is not scientific fact, but rather the origin myth of the modern age and a reflection of how we as a people often now perceive ourselves and certainly how others seem to perceive us. And so, while the out of Africa theory, as we have discussed in episode 2 of the Aristogenesis podcast, does not hold up in terms of scientific truth, it still resonates as true to those who hate us, be they members of our kin biologically or not. It is a myth that shapes their experience of the world, and it is from this idea and point of view that we approach the stories of our ancestors told of their own origins, as well as the stories of historical events that defined them as a people, that shaped their consciousness, and shaped our own in turn. As we have all come to realise, now more so than ever, the world we are living in is rapidly changing and deteriorating. Jobs and lifestyles that have been viable for centuries are now becoming unsustainable in the wake of all of the turmoil of the year, and for all we know, the world as we know it may not exist for too much longer, changing and regressing. Many of those who see what's going on liken this to the fall of Rome, but I believe we're instead repeating the events of the Bronze Age collapse. But this is not the place to discuss world events or predict the future. However, what may well happen is not the end of the world, but a chance to sever ourselves from the chains of modernity and go forward into a new era, an era of rebirth and rejuvenation, as we both reconnect with the old world of our ancestors and forge our own path in the new world to come. We will be the new men, the men prophesized by Nietzsche. The men who will break through modernity and nihilism and reshape the world in an image of our own design. We will soon be the seeds sown of new tribes new peoples that will grow and blossom into new kingdoms and new empires. And one day, our descendants will tell myths and stories of us, of the foundations and ethnogenesis of their peoples, recounting tales of glory of their origins, and ancient ancestors, and perhaps historians of their time will doubt the authenticity of them, too rich in tales of glory and honour. These are the times in which we live. Troy has fallen, my friends. So let us join with Aeneas and look to the new world we are to build in the image of the old. But first, let us learn of the tales and origins of our ancestors, be they Germanic, Nordic, Roman, Hellenic, Slavic or Celtic. We are going to be trying to avoid those origin stories which are, 
very obviously propaganda from dynasties trying to gain some legitimacy for their rule by linking it to a prestigious past. For example, the French claiming to be Trojans, or the British claiming to be Trojans, or the Scandinavians being Trojans. As you can see, there is a theme emerging here. Having Trojan ancestry allowed you to claim kinship with the Roman Empire and claim its territory is rightfully yours, a propaganda tactic exploited ruthlessly by medieval monarchs and dynasties. The French even going so far as to jail a man for libel when he had found the French to be a Germanic tribe, rather than the descendants of Trojans, as the Frankish nobility had claimed. So, for this reason, we will try to avoid rather cynical stories such as these, for they did not speak to and through the collective soul of a given people, but rather came from the mouthpiece of a ruling elite who wished to legitimise the rule of their respective dynasties. And so, we begin, as is right, with the origins of the white race. As all learned men know, the white race was created by the evil big-headed scientist Jacob, who created an evil race of albinoids who stole all of history from the black people who built literally every single civilization on the planet. Sorry, I couldn't resist. For those who don't get the joke, this is the story that Afrocentrists tell of the origin of white people. However, it's worth mentioning before we begin that the idea of a single pair origin, such as that with Adam and Eve, or even a single point of origin, such as that of the Out of Africa theory, was not accepted by pagans of the day. The ancient Greeks believed that most races of man sprang up from the earth itself after the flood of Deucalion, which we have spoken of frequently throughout many episodes of the podcast. These people were said to be backwards and stupid, and have no divine blood in them in contrast to the Greeks and their blood connection to the gods. This is a sentiment echoed by the last pagan emperor of Rome, Julian the Loyal, who wrote against the idea of a collective single origin of the different races, saying in his work against the Galileans, how different in their bodies are the Germans and Scythians from the Libyans and Ethiopians. And with that established, we can now delve into the founding myths of some of the ancient peoples of Europe, and the stories they told of their own origins. For us, these are stories of our own origins too, even if secularism and those who hate the myths and traditions of Europe wish to sever us from our ancestors, and approach them with the academic eyes of outsiders, rather than with the loving hearts of kin. Let us start then, with the Germanic peoples. As with most of the peoples we will cover in this list, their origins begin half shrouded in myth, with the figure of Twisto, whose name itself is a bit of a mystery. His name might mean son of Tu, the Germanic name for Dios Pitted, the Sky Father. It might mean double, or two, or twice, which could easily reflect the nature of twins found throughout Indo European myths, especially those concerning the foundation of tribes. It could be that he was seen as second in command to the Sky Father himself, a relationship comparable to that of Jupiter and Mars in the Roman pantheon. Perhaps he takes his name from the Indo European word Tuta, meaning the tribe, a name that appears throughout Indo European language and mythology. The term Teuton, the name of a particularly fearsome Germanic tribe, the Germanic and Celtic god Teutatus venerated by the Romans as Mars Teutatus, Mars of the tribe, as well as, as some scholars and myself believe, in the name of the founder of Troy and the Trojan race, Teucros. In fact, Jupiter, the Aryan sky father, promises in the Aeneid the whole world to the blood of Teucros. But we shall return to this later. However, modern scholars have decided that there is absolutely no connection between Twisto, the founder of the Germanic tribe, and Teuta, the Indo-European word for tribe. But personally, I believe the connection to be rather obvious. It's also worth noting that, according to Christian scholars of the 14 and 1500s, they, they believed that Twisto, the founder of the Germanic peoples, was actually a descendant of Noah, and went by another name, Ashkenaz. Certainly an interesting theory. 
Tweets, though, however, was not seen as the direct founder of the Germanic people, but rather that that honour was attributed to his son, Manus, a demigod whose name is the root of the word man in the first place. Twist, though, also appears in Vedic mythology as Twista, who has a son called Manu, the first man. Clearly, this is yet more evidence of the connections scattered throughout the Indo-European peoples and their myths. Manus, coincidentally, is also a Latin word meaning the hand. Manus has been connected to other founders than Manu of the Vedic tradition. It has also been proposed that the legendary king Minos is etymologically related by scholars such as R.T.H. Griffith. He is, after all, entwined with the myth of the bull, which bears special significance within Indo-European tradition. We will return to this in a moment, but first it is necessary to clarify the meaning of the bull in Indo-European tradition and myth. Sacrifice of the bull is an integral part of the Indo-European cosmological myth of Trito, of whom we have spoken of before. Trito, whose name means the third, sacrifices a bull to the gods. And perhaps one of these gods was Twisto, whose name, as we have mentioned, might mean two or double. Trito, in the myth, is said to give back the cattle he recovered from the three-headed serpent who stole them to the priest of his society, so that the priest may sacrifice it to Deus Peter. Deus Peter, then the second, then the third, once again we see the rule of three apparent in Indo-European societies, the trinity of gods that appears throughout them, from the Roman triad of Jupiter, Mars and Quirinus, to the Morrigan of Celtic myth, Wotan, Uvili and Veri of the Norse, and the three fates that appear throughout every mythology from Roman to Greek to Celtic to Norse to Shakespeare. We might even include the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in this idea of trinities given that it did not exist amongst Abrahamics until they had already lived under the Roman boot for a great many decades. This is, of course, reflected also in the three castes of Indo-European society, this rule of three seemingly shaping all of the Aryan worldview. Nikola Tesla himself even said that the number three was the creative power of the universe and held the key to creation itself, though this is of course, not the place for discussion of such things. In terms of the bull, as well as playing an integral part of the Indo-European creation myth, we also have a reflection of this in other later Indo-European mythology. It is cows that Apollo, god of the Hyperboreans, guards, who are stolen by Mercury, Hermes, Odin. It is a cow in the Norse myth who is the first primordial being. Cows in Hinduism are famously known as sacred beings belonging to the gods. The sun, at the time of the foundation of the zodiac, rose at the vernal equinox in the sign of Taurus, the bull, the same bull of heaven slain by Gilgamesh and Enkidu in Mesopotamian myth, said to belong to Ishtar or Venus, the sign of Taurus being said to be ruled by the planet Venus. The sign of Taurus begins on the 21st of April, the day of the foundation of Rome, after Romulus slew his twin, another key theme of Indo-European mythology that we explored briefly in episode 4. Mithras also slew the cosmic bull in the traditions of the Mithraic mystery cult. Cows and bulls also composed the majority of the diet of the original Indo-Europeans, who were pastoralists by nature. Clearly, the bull holds both physical and cosmic significance in Indo-European tradition. Going back to the myth of King Minos, whose name may well be derived from Manos, we can look at the character of his myth. He refuses to sacrifice his prized bull to Poseidon, and as a result, Poseidon punishes him with the most grave of humiliations. His wife becomes pregnant with a half-man, half-bull, whom men are then sacrificed to. This monster is the personification of the animal instincts within man, especially those who deliberately go against the gods. Men are brought from all around Greece, especially Athens, to be fed to this monster. If man will not sacrifice the bull, 
then men will be sacrificed to the bull, as the myth appears to imply. The Athenian hero Theseus then kills the Minotaur, the bull of Minos, for the sake of his country, thereby sacrificing both the bull and the animal within man in order to bring his country to power in accordance with Arian tradition. And therefore, we can once again identify a common theme of Indo-European ideas within collective mythology that, while on the surface appears different, in reality conveys the same themes and truths. Returning to Manus in the uniquely Germanic context, Manus was said to be the demigod ancestor of three sons, who gave their names to three people. The Ingiones, Erbinones, and Istoones. Tacitus, in his excellent work Germania, tells us this. In ancient lays, their only type of historical tradition, they celebrate Twisto, a god brought forth from the earth. They attribute to him a son, Manus, the source and founder of their people, from whose names those nearest the ocean are called Ingveones, those in the middle Hermenones, and the rest Istveones. Some people, inasmuch as antiquity gives free rein to speculation, maintain that there were more sons born from the god, and hence more tribal designations, the Marci, Gambrivi, Swaby, and Vandili, and that those names are genuine and ancient. While, of course, we do not have the time to delve into every Germanic tribe, of which there were a great many, the Swabians and Vandals should need no introduction to our listeners, and the Gambrivi lived on what is now the German border with the Netherlands. The Marci are particularly interesting, as there was also an ancient Italic tribe of the same name, and obviously the similarity with the name of the god Mars, especially considering the aforementioned epithet of Mars Tutatis, is so obvious that it's barely even worth pointing out. This may be only superficial, as etymology is not always an exact science, and similar words do not always mean that there is a definitive connection, but regardless, it is certainly interesting within its context. It is the first three that we will focus on for now, starting with the Ingviones. They were a branch of the Germanic people rather than a single individual tribe, though it is logical to assume they were once a single tribe that split off into a handful of smaller tribes while retaining a sense of unity in one way or another. Tacitus described the Ingviones as having kings who held only limited power, with the tribes being ruled more so by warlords who were expected to lead by example, rather than any kind of authority that had been bestowed upon them solely through political favour. Today, the group of languages collectively known as Ingveonic are Old Frisian, Old English and Old Saxon, and so it should be easy to assume who the descendants of the Ingveonis are in the modern day. Even the similarities between the modern term English bears some similarities to the term Ingveonic. The founder of all Anglo-Royal dynasties was said to be Ingui, either being named after Ingve or being the god himself, Ingve being another name of the Nordic god Freyr. The Ingveonis were said to be the ancestors of the Frisians, the Saxons, the Jutes and the Chalky. The Saxons and Jutes being very well known tribes to many of our listeners, we will focus for now on the Frisians and the Chalky, and return to the Saxons later. Unfortunately, almost all of the sources we have on these peoples ultimately come from the Romans, so every statement comes with an inherent bias. Though lucky for us, Tacitus never fails to provide a surprisingly balanced view of the ancient Germanic peoples, giving them their due reverence and respect. The Frisians were then, as they are today, for the most part, living in the same area and retaining their ethnicity, despite being absorbed for a great many years into the Roman Empire. It is a common fallacy that the Romans mixed with those they conquered, 
or even encourage mixing in those they ruled over. Instead, even the Frisians who had become fully Romanized retained their ethnic identity within the Empire, as a fort in Roman Britain attests to. Within it, there lies an inscription that reads, Cohortis prime Frisonorum Centurio Valerius Vitalis, Valerius Vitalis, centurion of the first cohort of the Frisians. This is not only a marking of the Frisians themselves, but also of the centurion, who wished for his memory and his service as both a Roman centurion and an ethnic Frisian be remembered. However, their relations with the Romans had not always been peaceful. At first, the Romans treat them fairly and with a good deal of respect. However, a particularly cruel and unnamed Roman governor began to levy ridiculous taxes against them. The Romans, either out of respect for the just cause the Frisians had to revolt, or fearing that taking revenge would only lead to further retribution, opted to make peace with the Frisians, demanding no concessions from them, and let them be. However, bad blood does not go away so easily, and the Frisians and Romans would make war on another a few more times. One of these wars was the Batavian Uprising, led by the legendary Batavian commander Julius Civilis, a Roman citizen who demanded better treatment for his ethnic kin. When the Emperor Vespasian seized power after returning from Judea and ultimately decimating the rebellious nation, he listened well to the demands of these Dutch revolutionaries, having personally served alongside Civilis and many of his men in the years before. These Dutchmen were famed as the bravest amongst all the Germanic peoples, and had even fought alongside the Romans during their wars against the famous Arminius, making up most of the Emperor's bodyguard, so feared and respected as they were amongst the Romans. This bodyguard was known as Cohos Batavorum Miriaria Kiwium, Romanorum Pia Fidelis, the thousand strong cohort of Batavians, Roman citizens, dutiful and loyal. Notice again the special attention paid to both their citizenship as Romans and their ethnic origin. They were granted a special deal, almost unheard of in the Roman Empire. They would pay no taxes, they would be allowed to govern themselves, and they would suffer no more aggression from Rome. The only condition was that the Batavi continued to supply the empire with men. Tacitus tells us, they furnished to the empire nothing but men and arms. Cassius Dio, meanwhile, gives us an example of the bravery of these men during the invasion of Britannia, and even goes as far as to distinguish them from barbarians, uncharacteristic of a Roman historian. He tells us of the Battle of River Medway. The barbarians thought that Romans would not be able to cross it without a bridge and consequently encamped in rather careless fashion on the opposite bank. But he sent across a detachment of Germanic tribesmen, who were accustomed to swim easily in full armour across the most turbulent streams. Thence the Britons retired to the River Thames at a point near where it empties into the ocean, and at flood tide forms a lake. This they easily crossed because they knew where the firm ground and the easy passages in this region were to be found, but the Romans in attempting to follow them were not so successful. However, the Germans swam across again and some others got over by a bridge a little way upstream, after which they assailed the barbarians from several sides at once and cut down many of them. Instead of attempting to crush the Batavian revolt, as he had proven himself more than willing to do during his campaign of destruction throughout Judea, the Emperor Vespasian made peace with the Dutch rebels he had fought alongside, and asked only that they continued to supply the Empire with their fearsome warriors, this time not by obligation however, but as well-paid volunteers. These terms Kivalis deemed acceptable to his people, allowing them both autonomy and the opportunity to win fame and glory in war, and the two sides made peace, a peace that lasted for as long as the Empire itself. And so we see much of the character of the ancient Dutch, 
A people opposed neither to war nor to civilization, but opposed very much to being ruled unjustly. Prepared to draw arms at a moment's notice in order to secure the well-being of their people. Vehemently opposed to slavery and subjugation. Preferring war on their own terms to peace at the expense of their own freedom. And yet equally being open to reason, negotiation and good terms of peace. <laughs>